you're going to get a big metabolic response because that's a lot of tissue, right? So you don't want to skip leg day. Go ahead, Kirk. Welcome everybody. For those who are alumni, so nice to see you back for a little visit and for new folks to Mountain Trek, welcome. I'm the program director of Mountain Trek and Katya is our fitness director and general manager. And the majority of this evening is going to be sh shared from Katya's perspective as our fitness director, looking at how do we look after um, aging and our metabolism as we age by making sure that we're not losing our main furnace, which is muscle. And so both dietarily and exercise wise, Koch is gonna to touch in on body composition, that measurement balance and ratios between water, fat and muscle, so that we can continue to look after ourselves and our muscle skeletal system as we age. And then this is gonna be the first of a few more health talks on what we call health span. And we've adopted that term rather than longevity because it includes a sort of a disability free aging is where we're looking at it from. And one of the key disabilities that many people struggle as they age is the lack of muscle that keeps them holding their balance and their core and mobility and stability and leads to falling and breaking a hip and then the end. So this is a very, very practical level of maintaining health span. So I pass the recipes and current research that Koch has been doing over to her to lead that. And then I'll complement from the other parts of our balanced perspective, which would be stress, sleep, and detox, and how they also complement the muscle gaining and skeletal dancing activities that she's going to be talking about. Great. Thanks, Kirk. All right. Welcome, everybody. It is so lovely to see faces that are familiar and new to me. Um, and for those of you that haven't attended Mountain Trek this year, this uh, information is, is some new lecture material that we're presenting this year. So it'll be a little bit fresh for, for those of you that have attended Mountain Trek in the past. Um, and, uh, and so that'll be exciting. So today we're talking about metabolism. So let's first just define what metabolism is. So metabolism is simply the process by which your body is converting both food and drink into energy for your body to perform everything from brain function to movement, to you sitting on the couch right now breathing, to your cellular regeneration and repair. So it is not um, just simply metabolism for movement, it's also all of those processes in the body. Now, we're, when we're thinking about metabolism, we have two metabolic pathways in the body. So we have an anabolic state, which is also considered a growth state, and we have a catabolic state. And when we're in an anabolic state, that which is what we're shooting for, and we're trying to optimize when you're uh, at Mountain Trek for the week and teach you tools so that you can take those home to continue to build on it. That's when we see things like high levels of DHEA, which is a precursor to all of our sex hormones. We see balanced hormones. We see things like high levels of bone mineral density. Um, we also see high levels of positive inflammation, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more as we get into the strength training and what that is. Um, and when we're in a catabolic state, that's really a decay state. And that is categorized by the inverse of everything. So low DHA, unbalanced hormones, low bone mineral density, and an upregulation of cortisol, which is, of course, one of our stress hormones, um, and also high levels of insulin um, and chronic inflammation. Unfortunately, in today's day and age, sitting really has become the new smoking. And we are sitting now more than we ever have before. In fact, this is the first time in human history that we're seeing muscle loss in children. The first time in history. That should that that is disturbing. And so we also have this abundance of calories, many of which, of course, are empty. And then this it, it develops this perfect storm. And so we know that we, as we start to degenerate, that decline can be fairly rapid. Um, and that can lead from everything to, like Kirk mentioned, a broken hip um, to chronic illness and disease. 
And so our goal here, when we're talking about promoting health span, as Kirk said, uh, is, is to have not just a long life, but a vital life. So it's not just living a long time, because quite frankly, we're fairly good at that. I have two grandparents that are now both 100 years old each this year. Um, but the last 10 years of their life haven't been that pleasant. And so we really want to kind of reframe when we talk about that longevity piece about what does health span look like and how can we optimize it so that unlike my grandfather who's in a wheelchair and having to have someone feed him liquefied food all day long what do we want that final decade to look at, like and that's when we're thinking about our metabolism we think about those ways okay how can we shift into that growth state and you know normally when we talk about those sort of anabolism we think about just 17 year old boys but what's interesting is that we can change this oh, at any time so it is not just for for young teenage boys what's interesting too about our metabolism the current research shows that our metabolism metabolism is actually highest when we are babies. Um, and it declines at a rate of about 0.7% per year up until our 20s. And at the 20s, it actually levels out and it stays fairly consistent. And most people think, oh, I hit 30 and everything goes downhill, my metabolism drops. It actually doesn't start to really so show significant decline until we're about in our 60s. And even then, it doesn't progress that, that, that quickly. Unfortunately, what does decline, though, as we age, um, as I referred to, it's happening in younger pe people is sarcopenia. So that's age related muscle loss. And we lose muscle uh, at a rate of about three to 8% per decade after the age of 30, if we are not consistently training and working our muscles. So that old adage of, you know, the, the less you move, the less you'll be able to move. And the more you move, the more you're going to be able to move. And so when we're thinking about our, our metabolism, we really want to focus on that key component of our muscle health. So our muscle, our lean muscle mass, you should be treating like liquid gold in your body. Ideally, you are retaining that muscle as long as you can. Now, remember, when we're losing muscle, we are not just simply shrinking, although that's part of it, but we are also losing muscle function when we lose muscle. And so it's innervation, it's balance, it's power, it's strength, it's all of those things, but also just basic function. So that can be simply the ability to trip on a carpet and catch our leg out in front of us. Those kinds of things where speed actually becomes very important before we had the fall, we tripped on something and couldn't get our foot out. And that all relates back to that muscle function. And so as we start to lose muscle as we age, um, that's, that's a key factor in our metabolism. Each of us has a basal metabolic rate. So that's the rate at which we all individually burn calories. And that doesn't change that much um, person or we can't change that that much because there are certain factors such as age, um, gender, height, body size, muscle comp or body composition. All of those things are going to contribute to your BMR. But what we can start to adapt is we can start to adapt that muscle mass component of that. Now let's think about what, how, how muscle and how adipose tissue functions. So muscle burn is very metabolically active and muscle. If we think about one pound of muscle, it burns approximately six calories per hour. Okay. And if we look at adipose tissue, fat tissue, that burns approximately two calories per hour. So over a 24 hour period, one pound of muscle would burn approximately 94 more calories than fat. So let's take two examples where we have a person who's, let's say, 28 years old, and maybe they have played sports, um, and maybe you know someone like this, and they can eat they can eat like a horse, right? They can eat whatever they want. You probably know someone like this. Maybe you were someone like this. And then we have someone who's maybe she's 58 years old, and uh, she says, you know, I'm starting to get this muffin top now, and and I really I, I haven't changed much. Nothing, you know. I, I retired a few years ago, and and now I just I seem to be gaining a pound a year. So if we look at that person and we look at her at 28 years old, it's as if she's driving a Ferrari. Her she's metabolically very very active because that muscle tissue is is requiring a lot of energy in order for it to stay alive. Now we fast forward her to 58 years old. 
And now she's exchanged and she probably hasn't even really realized it, to be honest, because maybe she was an overly muscular person. But over time, she has lost her muscle because of sarcopenia, because she hasn't been regularly using it. And over that time, she's slowly shifted out of that Ferrari mode, and she's now driving a minivan. But she, <laughs> no offense to mini, minivan drivers here. But she's now functioning metabolically quite slow. And she didn't even realize that she switched out her vehicle. And so that metabolic activity went down because she didn't maintain that lean muscle mass as she aged. So when we think about the importance of this muscle tissue in our body, let's think about why. So apart from the fact that muscle function and injury preven prevention, it's also the site of all of our glucose metabolization, which is incredibly important when I keep moving out of the, the sun and it keeps, it keeps chasing me. Um, when it comes to glucose metabolization, because when, when we think about things like metabolic diseases, type two diabetes, all of those things depend on that critical glucose metabolization. So muscle is also the storehouse of all of the amino acids in our body and all of our protein synthesis and all of that. So it's an incredibly important organ. In fact, it's the lar largest organ in your body. It is an organ. And what's even more interesting is it's an endocrine or organ. And so when muscle contracts, it actually releases hormones and proteins out into the body and it creates an endocrine system function. So muscle is so, so critically important for our BMR to keep that basal metabolic rate, that Ferrari versus the minivan to keep us active and healthy as we age so that we have speed and power and muscle function. And also for all of this glucose metabolization. So as we age, that's one of the reasons why it's so incredibly important. And unfortunately, muscle becomes anabolically resistant as we age, which means that protein synthesis becomes more challenging for it. So what do we do in order to preserve this um, metabolic currency in our body? It really is a metabolic sink. So the, the first one that I would like to address is strength training. So we don't build muscle um, adequately through things like, for example, running, doing yoga, um, going to Pilates, um, riding a bike, doing Peloton. Uh, even going for a walk. Okay. Those things wouldn't be considered strength training. When I'm thinking about strength training, I'm thinking about picking up heavy things and putting them down. <laughs> it sounds simple and it is. So apart from keeping our muscle tissue incredibly healthy, it also keeps our bone mineral density really high. And as we age, if you look at a chart of women, particularly when they go through menopause, it's, it's actually quite amazing. It goes from here and it's literally a cliff that you jump off as you go through menopause. Men, it happens a little bit later. It's more in their 60s. So when we're thinking about um, bone mineral density, like Kirk referred to before a broken hip, that, I mean, after the age of 65, your risk of death, death goes up 15 to 20% from a broken hip after the age of 65. That's fairly significant. And that's not necessarily just the broken hip. It's the other factors that may come along because of that. So we want to keep those bones healthy and active. If you know people below the age of 25, absolutely have them strength training. Um, that's going to be helping them to build their financial bone account for the rest of their lives. So it's really, really important. That whole myth about children not, you know, not strength training is, is, is very well debunked. So we, for our bone health, we absolutely want to be doing strength training. So strength training, how much, how long, you know, it's, I always start with how much time do you have? Um, so if you have say, Hey, I've got five days a week and how many days a week should I be doing strength training? I'd say, let's, let's try and hit it three days a week. If you say to me, look, I only have two days a week to act to, to exercise. Let's do one day a week strength training. So don't put the pressure on yourself to think that I have to do five days a week. It's really about tailoring what, what time do you have and how can you maximize that within your own life? So, uh, you know, even if you go from zero to one day a week, that's a hundred percent improvement, right? So strength training, we want to think about hitting every single part of our body, at least, you know, if we can two days, two to three days a week would be great. Now, here's what's key when we, when we, when we're talking about strength training. 
we we historically and the data you know supported this even five years ago three years ago we thought okay with more strength training we need to stick in that eight to 12 rep range in order to maximize testosterone and human growth hormone and the current data honestly just doesn't support that what it shows now is that when we're strength training we really need to be training near maximal muscle failure okay so that means that it we can do that in five reps I could take you to near muscle failure. I could also do that with 30 reps and take you to that same almost near maximal failure. So the rep range isn't as important. What really is critically important is that we go to near maximal failure. And that's how we're going to generate an adaptive response. Now, when I'm talking about an adaptive response, that's what I'm talking about when I said earlier about positive inflammation. So when, for example, we're doing a bicep curl, our body is going to, if we're getting to near maximal failure, we're almost there and ooh, we're really having to work at it, we're going to create a small amount of damage in our muscle tissue and small micro tears. And that's, that's go going to create a response in your body. Just like if you had a virus enter your body, it would send an SOS out to your immune system saying, Hey, Hey, we got to fight this thing. It's exactly the same sort of system. Your body gets a signal from the tissue to your brain. It says, okay, we need to send out this hormone cascade. And then it creates this response of regrowth in that muscle tissue. And that's essentially what hypertrophy is. So we, we want to be able to trigger a response. So if we just go all willy nilly into the gym and go, well, I'm just going to do some light weights here. And, you know, a few here, that's really not going to be very effective. So if you were investing money, you wouldn't just throw your money all over the place, right? You would be investing it with someone that knows what they're doing and that you were going to get a good return on that investment. It's exactly the same thing. When you make time to go into the gym, I would recommend that you find someone who has experience or a program that you can really rely on and you, you, you get a good solid training program that has progressive overload so that you're getting a good return on your time and energy. So that would be one key component is strength training. And there's absolutely no replacement for strength training. Um, and every single person should be doing it. There's not really any exceptions that I can think of. Okay. Now, the other thing that happens when we strength train is that our body needs to repair that tissue. And, and like I said earlier, our muscle tissue is metabolically hungry. And so we need to be feeding that tissue and regrowing that tissue well. And what helps that, what is the, the main macro is protein. So protein is the builder macro out of the three. You have carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And you think about protein as being sort of the builder macro of all of the cells in your body. So it's really, really important for all of that regeneration in your body and for building and retaining that lean muscle mass. So when we are um, waking up in the morning, we have moved into more of that catabolic state. Our bodies have that beautiful cir circadian rhythm that Kirk talks a lot about with sleep and with stress um, throughout our lectures that many of you I'm sure have heard about before. We also go into that miniature sort of circadian to anabolic rhythm within a 24 hour period. And ideally we break out of that right away in the morning by ingesting food, ideally it's protein. It's some sort of protein or it has, it has protein in it. And that will stimulate an anabolism. It will stimulate protein synthesis. So it's sort of like it turns on the light and then we're roaring to go. We're roaring to build that muscle tissue through the day. So it's really, really important that we, we start our day with that protein. And then um, we that will also allow us to get adequate amounts of protein through the day. Whereas if we leave it and then suddenly we get to dinner time, we've had no protein all day. Maybe all we've had is a bowl of cereal in the morning and latte and a muffin and we skipped lunch or we had a pro, you know, maybe we had a, a banana and then we suddenly get to dinner time. Um, and, you know, how are we going to get the protein that we need in if we don't spread it out during the, throughout the day? So let's think about how much protein is enough protein. So this is a, a hotly debated topic. Um, and, and I always go with a, a sort of a, a bare minimum. And my our bare minimum recommendation would be 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight. And I would actually lift that all the way up to one for one. So that would mean that if I weighed 130 pounds, I would be shooting ideally to have approximately 130 grams of protein per day. Now, 
for many of us, that's quite a bit of protein, which speaks to what I said earlier, which was we want to spread that protein out. Because if we try and, you know, what are we going to do at the end of the day, have a a tire plate full of steaks, like that's not really going to be, be feasible, you know, so we're going to start that earlier in the day. And that can be a blend of plant and animal, or depending on what diet you choose, you know, both of them, uh, you know, there's arguments in the nutrition community, you can get hotly debated arguments about is plant protein bioavailable? And is it locked up in fiber? The reality is, is that just like, um, you know, our nutrition, a wonderful nutritionist, Jen says, is we're filling our plate up with plants primarily. So when I'm talking about protein, I'm not talking about a plate of bacon. I am talking about your protein as your small portion, along with your beautiful plate of colorful vegetables and fruits primarily. So if we spread that protein out throughout the day, then we'll be able to feed that muscle and feed that lean machine that we're trying to build so that we can hopefully shift out of that sort of slow anabolic minivan energy and into at least a BMW somewhere in there. We might not ever get to a Ferrari, but at least we can get to that BMW in the middle zone. And by doing that, that will help us to preserve that lean muscle mass as we age, which is so incredibly important for for being able to be active individuals that can function and sit down on the toilet and bend over and tie up our own shoes and all of those kinds of things. Um, So... When here at Mountain at Mountain Trek, we start our day with a protein smoothie, and that's a really easy way for you to to get some of that protein in. Um, you can have a, a grass fed whey, is what I we would recommend at Mountain Trek. That's what we use. And if you don't do dairy products, um, then you could always use so, so you know sort of a hemp or a pea protein um, as a replacement. That would also work. Um, I would recommend though that it's a grass fed whey. Uh, that's the sort of the cleanest and the purest form. But that being said, really the majority of that protein should really be coming from whole foods. So we want to be leaning into those lean meats, you know, chicken, turkey, seafood, and of course, plants, all of those beautiful legumes and grains that are full of, of wonderful proteins that are really available and full of amino acids and all of the other vitamins and minerals that we need. And then if we're able to spread that out throughout the day, then by the end of the day, we're hopefully we've gotten close to that target. So if you're unsure, well, I don't know how much protein is in something, the best way to do is to track it. So there's wonderful, wonderful apps that you can use. There's one called My Fitness Pal. Um, it's one that I have used historically. You can get the free version or the premium version. It doesn't really matter. Either will work. And even if all you do is input your food for one week, it's a really, really great learning tool. And then at the end of the week, you can you at the end of each day you can see okay how many grams of protein did i hit and am i even close to my 0.8 to 1 gram per pound of body weight and if i'm not how can i create small adjustments so i can help to support that because like i said as you age ingesting protein actually becomes more critical um so that we can we can keep that lean mean active machine of muscle in our body. Um, are there any questions on any of that? I know I, I that was a bit of an information overload um, and you can tell I'm passionate about it, um, but I'd love to field any questions. Alex, did you have any that came up to you? Catherine raised her hand, it looks like. Okay. Catherine, go ahead. Can you thank unmute you. Yourself? Yeah, I was. Um, thank you so much for for doing this. I really appreciate it because I'm trying to learn to love weight training. <laughs> I don't love it yet, but I want to ask you about the fatigue. Because as an example, if I do push ups, I do three sets of eight, and by the time I'm on the third set, that eighth, maybe even ninth push up, I just am dying. Is that the right fatigue, or should you be fatiguing on that first set? That's a really great question, Catherine. So here's what I would say is if if I'm working with someone who's fairly new to exercise, I would go for the, let's start those first two sets where you're able to hit that target. It's still hard, but you're able to hit it. And then by that third set, or if you go all the way up to four or five sets, but that three to five sets is usually what I kind of recommend, no less than that. If by that third set, I definitely want you to be failing by the end. Absolutely. And then Catherine, as you get better and as you start to get more, you know, more comfortable with strength training and hopefully fall in love with a little bit more, then I don't mind if you're failing closer on that first rep, you know, on that first set, and then you can sort of start to build that. And that will build with time. I mean, eventually you'll be like, oh gosh, now I can do, you know, 10 or 12. Um, So I would say build that progressively and get, get to failure, you know, by the third set is, is, is fine, especially as you begin. Does that answer that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Christine. Hey, thank you so much, Katia. Um, so the protein requirement, you said it's 0.8 to one per pound. Is that the only variable? So my teenager who's 16 versus, um, you know, someone older, just do the math and that's how much protein. Are there any other variables that affect that desired amount? Yeah. Okay. Great question. And that, that actually brings up a good point, which I didn't mention before, um, which is that I'm talking about ideal body weight. So right. let's say you're 180 uh, pounds. Okay. Right. And your doctor has told you you should, you should probably be around 150. And I'm not talking mm -hmm. about the weight that you were when you were 18. Okay. Right. I'm talking about your ideal weight for what mm -hmm. would you would be at this age. Mm -hmm. You want to target that. So if I'm 180, but I should, you know, ideally I would target towards 150 for a healthy body composition. I would be eating 150 and that's the right. same, whether or not I was 18 or 90, it's okay. not going to change. I, I, okay. It would be the same ratio. Now, the only changes that I would say is, you know, if we had particular goals, like you were a bodybuilder, then we would be going much higher than one for one. But right. I'm really trying to just make this for sort of the average consumer, not an elite performance athlete. So that okay, would be so, so it's ideal weight. So if you are heavy, you shouldn't be going by, I get to eat this much more protein. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just and checking. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. The other interesting thing about protein is it has the greatest amount of satiety of all of the macros, which means mm -hmm. it's going to make you feel full longest. It yeah. also has the greatest thermic effect of all of the food, which means that you're burning energy just by consuming it. So mm -hmm. protein has a thermic of effect of about 20 to 30%. So if, for example, I'm having, let's just, I'm just a random number. I eat hundred calories of chicken. Mm -hmm. I'm actually going to burn about 20 to 30 of those calories, just digesting it. So it's a bit of a, it's a great secret sort of fat mm -hmm. loss weapon because I'm feeling full longer. I'm building that lean muscle tissue, which is going to be burning, you know, more mm -hmm. energy, which is helpful mm -hmm. if I'm trying to be in caloric deficit. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's also going to be burning those extra calories as, as I eat them. So I'm actually getting less calories than I'm even counting, which is helpful. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Simone, did you have a question? Hi, Katya. Great to see you. I Me miss too. your yoga classes. <laughs> um, so, okay. Quick question on the weights, just getting back to the strength training. Um, so when I do bar or hit and I have, you know, three, five and eight weights, I mean, does that count or not really? <laughs> you know, so this is, this is what I always say, um, Simone, is that consistency trumps everything else. Okay. So if that is the only way you're going to do, because you love that kind of fitness, I don't want to take that away from you and you're showing up and fitness is better than no fitness hands down. So I always go with cons consistency and showing up first. And, <laughs> and, um, so let's start with that. And so yay that you're doing it. Um, if I was going to optimize your fitness, I would say you probably are already doing that because you really love it, but I would really like it if you threw in a day that was just strength training and didn't have hit involved. If we really want to maximize strength gains and maximize that tissue, it really is best done on its own day. Um, it's it, when we start to mix it, it doesn't become as effective and we can blunt some of those effects. Unfortunately, doesn't mean it's not effective, um, but it's not as effective and no using three and five pound weights, you're definitely going to get things like muscular endurance built in. And that's wonderful and function and innervation. I mean, all of those are really important parts, but in terms of building and preserving muscle mass, not so effective, particularly when we think about uh, lower body and upper body, because when we, when we're doing upper body, like Catherine had asked about doing the push-ups, you know, you can get adaptive responses, which is what I'm wanting I doing upper body push-ups, um, you know, working with bands, you can still get that adaptive response consider if the weights are heavy enough. When we break it into lower body training, though, it's very, very difficult to get an adaptive response in those big, large metabolic sinky muscles like your glutes and quads with just body weight. If you were an absolute beginner, you might be able to get an adaptive response, but that's tricky with just body weight and you will plateau fairly quickly. So unfortunately, kind of belly button down, I want to add some weight on those. And, and you also also have to consider from belly button down, you're going to get a big metabolic response because that's a lot of tissue, right? So you don't want to skip leg day. You want to still be training leg day, but you got to do it with some weights. And, and yes, I'm, I'm with weights. They're going to have to be more than a three and a five pounder. I, I would think. <laughs> I thought you might say that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. Oh, hi. <laughs> so I have a question about, uh, I had never heard about doing 
three to five sets. That sounds like a lot. Um, <laughs> and wouldn't that take forever <laughs> if you're doing different <laughs> You know, you'd be surprised, Stephanie, it doesn't, you know, let, let, let's take two, two different exercises. For example, let's say you're doing, um, let's say a floor press on your back with a set of dumbbells, and then you're going to do an incline press. Let's say you've got two exercises, you're supersetting. And let's say you do um, 15 reps of one, you go up right into 15 reps of the other, and then you take a 90 second rest break in, in between. That's probably going to take you approximately hmm, three minutes per set maybe somewhere in there, you do three sets. Maybe we even stretch it to four minutes a set. We've got, well, we, then we've probably got 12 to 15 minutes on one body, but one, one zone of your body. So that's great. Yeah. You know, I really see strength training is you can, you can get a lot done in 45 minutes, uh, especially if you're, you know, um, not sitting around, you know, on your phone <laughs> in between sets, that's the big killer. You know, as I, I read a recent meme that said, you know, um, who was it, you know, um, Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, you never saw him making gains watching Instagram videos in between his sets. <laughs> so it's the same sort of idea. You can maximize that time. If you keep those rest breaks about 90 seconds long between sets and, and I'm, you, you know, 90 sec seconds to a minute is, is generally what I want to see in between those sets. Then no, it doesn't take you that long, especially if you're focused. And once you know what you're doing, maybe a little bit longer, of course, in the beginning, when you're unsure of your weights and you're just getting used to the movements, but once you get adept at it, you can get, you can get a good workout in 45 minutes. So are you talking about like doing things that combine different muscle groups all in, in one, not like just the triceps with one exercise and just the biceps? And Yeah. I mean, both of those are different training methods and I use both. Um, we use both at Mountain Trek. And so I like supersets just because I can maximize my time and I can really smother the muscle um, by giving it kind of two exercises that are similar, but targeting different muscle heads, that kind of thing. And that's really where, you know, kind of when I said before, working with a professional um, is useful, right? Because people that are adequately trained in this sort of movement can offer you really smart programming that is highly effective in 40 minutes. Um, and you don't need to be doing two hours. And, and, it, and that's really what you want to do, right? You want to be able to maximize that time. So that's where I would sort of defer to where you know, where you're at and, and work with a professional who can build a really solid program that can get you moving in the format that works best for your body. Because for some people, maybe working one muscle group at a time might work better for them. And, and that's really a little bit more individual. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, is there a chat in the bottom here? I see. Um, Wonder why I have high energy but low metabolism. Hmm. Well, my my question to why would I have low energy or low metabolism? I would say, what would be the, what would make you think that you have a low metabolism? Simone, I think that was your. Yeah, question. yeah, that was me. I'm uh, sorry, I thought I'd put it in there. Um, be, um, I don't know. I was told that actually. Okay. Um, <laughs> I know I have high energy, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, so I eat smaller meals. And I learned this at Mountain Trek, smaller meals more frequently. And of course, Mountain Trek recipes. Um, but um, yeah, I guess I've heard that more often. Or someone who has low energy has high metabolism. And that's weird to me. Um, do you mm -hmm. do any scientific explanation for that? Okay. Yeah. Kirk, you, you had something to offer there. Yeah. I, I think Simone, that one thing that dovetails with what Koch is talking about in terms of building the furnace that burns energy for us is that we have to work with the, the hormones also for our metabolism. And, and the thyroid is really the governor of our metabolism. So if it's too hyper, it'll be overly active and burn energy quicker than you can imagine. And if it gets suppressed, which tends to happen a lot more midlife and often for women, we can move into Hashimoto syndrome or, or just a depletion of, of the glands secreting the precursors for thyroid hormones. And then we're metabolically slower, even though we're working out and we're eating well and, and doing everything mechanically correct, hormones can still trump the speed of our metabolism. Oh, okay. so one thing we recommend at Mount Trek is like a midlife, 
everybody should get their hormones checked. And we recommend a Dutch test, which is done through naturopathic doctors, where you're doing a 10 point around the circadian day measurement with litmus paper of your urine for all of your hormones, including your thyroid, your human growth hormone, your cortisol, your melatonin for sleep, um, basically your DHEA, like I just said, the precursor for our sex hormones, your three estrogens, progesterone, testosterone, all of them. And then you can see what might need to be adjusted by lifestyle and perhaps even some supplementation from professional guidance. Um, so that would be one thing that we would probably say is if, if you're wondering why your metabolism is going slow or fast, and it seems all of a sudden or irregular for you, that that could be something you want to check in terms of hormones. What was and the name of that again, Kirk? Dutch, D-U-T-C-H, Dutch mm -hmm. test. And the lab is in America, but all of the naturopathic doctor, not naturopaths, but full seven-year doctor associated members of Canada, United States use the same lab in the United States. Okay. Thank you. Of course. I wanted to just also mm -hmm. come along on Katja's cat, cat, coattails, sorry, cattails, um, um, and talk a bit more about hormones, because when Koch is giving you the recipe to come to muscular failure. Um, basically, and we get that acute inflammation, which we call the positive inflammation. We want the hormones then to help us go into recovery to the repair and growth cycle. And that happens in sleep. So this is where sleep dovetails the effort during the day that Koch is prescribing to help us recover lost muscle through sarcopenia. And research is showing that the most important thing we need to do is, is sanctify the first part of the sleep, the deep non-REM sleep between 10 and midnight. That's when human growth hormone is released from the pituitary gland. And it's also when the hypothalamus, both these glands in the brain area, produces the precursor to make the human growth hormone. Then the human growth hormone goes out and brings us repair to the micro tears that we got in, in our cell structure from the work. And that's how we put in a little bit bigger cell. So all of a sudden, a little tiny one got inflamed acutely from that workout and those sets and reps. And then at night, if we're sleeping deeply, then the growth hormone helps us put in a little bigger one. And that's how we counter the sarcopenia. So sleep is critical and every professional athlete um, knows this doesn't matter what kind of athletic endeavor they do the body needs recovery and it's a hormonal recovery to help cell production to rebuild that met metabolic state of more more muscle mass the other thing that um that they've learned is more recently is that naps can actually help that too napping helps in the recovery after strength training on the stress side to also complement what Koch is talking about, we want to keep managing our stress hormone cortisol. It has to rise in the morning to help us wake and be smart through our workday, but it's supposed to wane as the atmospheric light shifts through the day. But if it stays up day after week after month due to stress, either mental, emotional, or physical, then basically it'll counter human growth hormone. Cortisol will, if, if it's too much and too consistent, will counter the production of human growth hormone because it'll take the hypothalamus, pituitary, and then the adrenal glands to keep us in a fight and flight, save the, the system mode and not go into growth and repair. It's just, you're just still running from the lion day after day after day. And repair and reconstruction of muscle cells has to happen when we're in a parasympathetic state when we're not in fight or flight and the hormone production is in its balanced state and then lastly i want to also bring another branch of our our balanced health tree to support what Koch is offering and that's the detoxification side so after we acutely or positively inflame those muscles there is going to be some waste products and metabolites from that process and those things we want to continue to help move through our eliminatory system so drinking lots of water use of electrolytes so we get electrolyte rebalancing 
Um, massage is really powerful to help with what's called uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, which is going to happen if you're going to that near failure position that Katya was talking about. Not only does the muscle massaging of the muscles help um, bring in oxygen and nutrification to those cells so that they repair and reconstruct quicker and better, but it also helps move the waste products through and helps move them through into the lymphatic system. And if you have a good massage that even includes some lymphatic drainage, that's going to help you move all of the waste products from that work out through the eliminatory system. And also including in that something you know we're all keen of at Mountain Truck, and that's hydrotherapy. So going from hot to cold, cold immersion is used by many, many professional athletes after they've done their strength training and their, their, their training of all kinds of, of body works. And it's, again, kicking up the circulatory system, which stimulates the lymphatic drainage and helps bring good uh, repair hormones and oxygen, oxygen and nutrients to the cell, but it also helps stimulate the lymphatic system for relief. So this is where balanced health is everything. We might be focusing on recovering lost muscle and bone as we age so that we can have a, a stronger metabolic furnace and a more powerful recovery body for tripping or, or moving quickly and things like that and balance and mobility, but all of the other parts integrate into it. We're not just a singular focus. Strength training includes sleep, stress management, and detoxification for it to be as potent as possible. Anything you can add to that, Katya? No, I, I think that summed it up really beautifully, Kirk. Um, I would just add on to that recovery formula is just really good, um, you know, plentiful diet that's going to be full of all of those wonderful plants and proteins and things that are going to really help your recovery. So we know that, you know, we don't want to drive that inflammation any further through mm -hmm. things like, you know, alcohol and sugar and those kinds of things, because they just don't optimize our recovery and they also don't optimize our sleep. So Actually, that's a great point because um, when we're under stress and we go for the coping mechanisms that we all do as humans, including that trifecta of carb, fat, and salt, when our glucose levels are too high, or a free lipid content is too high, they also block human growth hormone. So keeping our diet clean, less sugar, less unhealthy fats, like Katja is saying, we want to bring in the micro and macronutrients that are going to help rebuild and the, the building blocks that the body needs. And those are all essential for recovery of, of muscle. Stephanie, you want to go ahead? Yeah. So I was just going to ask you, Kirk. So you said, um, I forgot what important thing was happening from 10 to midnight. Um, but what if you don't go to bed until midnight? Then does it happen? Or If you want optimal recovery and, and repair and replacement and growth, your deepest sleep, that's stage three and four of deep non-REM, is when we get the most surge of growth hormone from our pituitary gland into our body. So if we're going to bed at midnight, you're definitely missing out on it. So okay. that's why athletes have curfews. You look yeah. at young athletes, a hockey team that's a bunch of teenagers, they're in bed at nine. There's no fooling around because they knew that if they're going to work that hard and they need the recovery, it's not just about hours in bed, but it's critical. It's the depth of sleep in that first two hours of sleep is when we get the biggest surge of growth, growth hormone into the system. So it wouldn't happen from midnight until 2 a.m.? Much less, okay. much less. Okay. So think think how a, a professional athlete of any kind treats their overall day-to-day -day health. They go by circadian clocks to manage their hormones. They're doing all the micro-macro nutrients that Koch is talking about. And they live a very strict life to have that recovery so that they can be optimized. Yeah. I like to think about it as, you know, we're not much different than plants, you know, and that we we open in sunlight and we close in the evening. We really aren't that much different no. than plants. We run and on the same light. Yeah. And so if we're changing our, our bedtime routine 
uh, we're not aligning with the, the rhythms of light and that, uh, you know, our minds might tell us, oh, well, I can just get that sleep later. But unfortunately, just like a plant, um, it's not going to grow adequately if it doesn't have proper light. It's the same thing with your body. Yeah, it's, it's so hormonal, Stephanie, that's out of our control because it does run off of sunlight. Atmospheric light sets all of our hormonal, hormonal cascades. So the takeaway is you can be 58 and still drive a Ferrari. <laughs> That's right. Or at least a BMW, a really sexy BMW. Um, yeah, you can change this. This is what's so amazing about this, you know, mm -hmm. is that we can go into an anabolic growth state at any time. Um, you know, there's been studies that show women in their 70s and 80s that picked up strength training that all had osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is one of the, you know, of course, the precursor. After an eight week training program, every single one of them showed an increase in their bone mineral density. It is never too late. So, yes, you can switch that vehicle in. And on that point, Katja being our beloved yoga teacher for over 20 years at Mountain Trek, yoga has to or flexibility has to be with us too we can't just build without keep lengthening or we're going to put too much pressure on the joints and the body is just as resilient with stretching and flexibility as it is with strengthening so you could start yoga at 80 and you it's amazing how you can change your your posture and your freedom in your joints mm -hmm.